Hi everyone. So I know this is a bit weird and I'm sorry for that, but uh, God knows I'm pretty weird myself. So if you're watching this, it means that I'm somewhere else. In this case, I'm probably in Queen Creek, which is kind of odd because I'm in Queen Creek right now. But hey, it's the 21st century. We have the technologies. Um, so if you bear with this weirdness, this whole video thing and the bad lighting that I've got going on over here, I'll tell you about the book that I read, which is called Shinju by Laura Jo Rowland. So, since we're doing historical fiction this time around, uh, I accidentally picked something that was, you know, familiar, but it accidentally tied to last month's mystery genre, because Shinju is a historical mystery set in 17th century Japan, which is also known as the Genroku era. Now, long ago and far away, I got a uh, degree in the history of Japanese popular culture. Um, so even though I switched my uh, specialty to the history of science soon after I graduated, um, I'm still really fond of Japanese pop culture. It's beautiful. It's fascinating. It's occasionally really, you know, it's occasionally really bizarre, which you know that's that's kind of the thing that I'm into. So uh, about the book and about sort of samurai in general, because this features a samurai detective. So how can you go wrong? Um, so just as Arizonans and Americans in general are kind of you know hung up on cowboys in the Wild West. The Japanese have, you know, a similar adoration for samurai, which, okay, but the difference here isn't just the, uh, the culture, but it's also the time scale, because the Wild West period of American history lasted for maybe 120 years, say from the late 1700s to the early 20th century. Uh, meanwhile, the tradition of the samurai lasted for over a thousand years, with its origins in the 8th century or Heian era Japan. Um, the point is that uh, the cowboy story is typically set in the 1800s, and there's your time period. It's 1868. It's either pre-Civil War or post-Civil War. Um, the story of the samurai could be set anywhere between 780 and 1868, which is basically the end of the historical samurai as we know them, uh, as they sort of fell out of power with the restoration of the Meiji Emperor. So... Shinju is set in a period of Japanese history that was relatively peaceful. Um, and the reason it was so peaceful was because this is the time of the Tokugawa shogunate. Um, see, at the, uh, before this, there were two warring clans, the Tokugawa and the Nobunaga. Um, and throughout the uh, late 16th century, there were battles, there were skirmishes, there were wars. It was called a warring states period for a reason. And this eventually culminated in the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600, when the Tokugawa clan pretty much just soundly defeated the Nobunaga. Um, and that, with that, the Tokugawa became the last ruling shogunate of Japan, uh, but that's not bad because they did rule the, uh, rule the island for uh, about 268 years. So the thing is, uh, when they won, that was kind of it for the local wars. They're the big kid on the block. They're the dominant. So there really wasn't another clan capable of challenging them directly. So it was basically peace through superior firepower and uh, peace through superior numbers. So when you're a samurai who's been brought up as a young boy and trained for war, prepared for battle, um, what do you do when full-scale peace breaks out? Well, you still retain your high status. Uh, the samurai were actually a class, and this was a class, you know, of just basically semi-nobility, but above the commoner. So the samurai were, of course, the warriors, and there's this warrior clan, and they enjoyed a higher status than most. Um, so they were the only ones allowed to carry swords. And if you're a samurai in this era and there's no wars to fight, you, uh, you go into government work. So, uh, our detective, Sano Ichiro, is just such a man. He's not really a veteran of any major skirmish, um, and he's living during the time of the fifth Tokugawa shogun, uh, called Suniyoshi. He, uh, Suniyoshi, that is, is the great-grandson of Tokugawa Ieyasu, and peace has been the rule for over a hundred years now. So, one quick side note before I get into this. Um, Japanese names are reversed from, uh, how, uh, American names work. So the family name comes first. And this is how uh, Ichi, you know, Sano Ichiro is identified. In America, he'd be Ichiro Sano, uh, but this is a long time before America became a going concern in Japan. So anyway, uh, 
Sano is subservient to the Shogun and is ordered to come to Edo, which is now modern-day Tokyo. Uh, and he's going to take on the position of Yoriki, which in this case is a detective, an, an investigator, um, you know, basically a detective chief inspector, if we uh, wanted to apply sort of the British uh, rule to it. Um, he's out of his element, because before this, he's a historian. He's a teacher. Uh, he's not a cop. Uh, but he's smart, and, you know, when the Shogun says jump, y you jump. Uh, and when you're told, congratulations, you're the new detective chief inspector, uh, then congratulations, you're a police officer. Uh, but beyond that, um, he's not into the petty intrigues of his fellow Yoriki. He doesn't have time for that. So he doesn't fit in. He's not into making friends with the others because he doesn't want to play the games. He's not into office politics, and he's also not lay into laying back while all of his underlings and servants do all the work. He's into getting things done, um, even if he's not 100% sure how to go about it. Now, this is not an Inspector Clouseau type thing. The, the guy is not stupid. He's just never been a cop before. And now he's not only a cop, but he's a detective. So... Early in the book, he's summoned to see the magistrate, who can act as a judge and jury in criminal cases. He can also order investigations, and this is exactly what he does. So, as it happens, a beautiful woman of noble blood and an actor are found together in the river, and they are quite dead. Um, looks like an apparent suicide, and this is what gives the book its title, as Shinju means double suicide. Um, this is usually a lover's suicide. Uh, they do when their families don't agree with the union. Um, so, in, in this case, obviously, the noble family of the woman did not agree with the actor boyfriend. So, rather than, you know, bring disgrace to their family, they killed themselves together as a sort of final act of defiance. Um, but what's startling about this is just that. The, uh, the woman's of noble blood, and this is an actor. Her, her, her lover's an actor, and that's one of the lowest classes um, and professions of the time. Uh, the pleasure quarters of Edo, uh, in other words, the Red Light District, is awash in theater and musicians and craftsmen and geisha and prostitution. Um, contrary to popular belief, geisha are not prostitutes, um, though some of them did do that as a side gig. Um, that wasn't what they were for. So, the noses of her family were firmly turned up at the impudence, and her suicide was not an honorable way to die anyhow. So she's dead to her family in more ways than one. So the thing is, is Sano senses that something is wrong, something's amiss. And he, uh, the magistrate basically orders him to do a cursory investigation, clear the case, close the case, move on. Uh, the family doesn't want any embarrassment, and who gives a damn about the actor? So, like any good detective, uh, Sano goes digging. Uh, but things are complicated in a very obvious and powerful fact that's not obvious if you don't know much about the Japanese. So, it's been said that the Japanese live Shinto and die Buddhist. So, there's a duality of religion that's pervasive in Japanese culture and has been for, you know, over a thousand years, in that Shinto is the traditional belief system, while Buddhism is a transplant from China by way of India. So, Shinto has very strict beliefs and rules about a lot of things, which is, you know, pretty standard in most religions. But above all, Shinto is into cleanliness, and Shinto abhors death in all forms. So there's a belief in how certain things can make one unclean in a spiritual sense. We're talking about the soul. And the dead, especially, are reviled for this very reason. And any contact with the dead, is it absolutely taints the soul. So Buddhism has no problem with death. It's part of samsara. This is the never-ending cycle of life, birth, death, you know, the ever-running cycle. Um, even today, uh, the people of Japan worship at Shinto temples with their iconic tori gates, you know, these are the big gates with the tall curved thing at the top and the, you know, the poles that go down. Um, when you go to a Shinto shrine, you are expected to wash before you leave your house. You are expected to wash again when you arrive and before you go in. So that's what they do when they're alive. When they're dead, final preparations are often handled by a Buddhist priest. The Shinto priest does not 
touch or concern themselves with the dead. So the samurai themselves are so tied to Shinto that they're practically steeped in it like tea. So when Sano sets off to uh, visit the morgue and have a look at the bodies, which is something he's supposed to do, he's filled with this dread that many Americans just wouldn't get. So at the morgue, uh, something really cool happens. I kind of like this part. Sano is legitimately freaked out. Um, but he's driven by a sense of justice. He wants to see justice done, and he thinks something is wrong here. So he meets a doctor there, and it's a person that he thought was dead. Um, and that freaks him out even more, because here he is in a morgue, there's all these dead people around, and here's a guy who's supposed to be dead. Um, the doctor disappeared ages ago, um, tainted by rumors of body snatching and immoral and despicable contact with the dead. Well, going back to that Shinto thing. The thing is, is he's actually been studying Western medical techniques, which were brought to Japan by the Dutch. The Dutch East India Company got up to everywhere in the world at one time. And Japan was uh, very special to the Dutch because they were basically the only foreigners allowed any sort of trade contact with the nation of Japan. So the Japanese called this Dutch, uh, Dutch learning Rangaku, and in some cases, it was forbidden because the Dutch didn't have any Shinto-based hang-ups. I mean, you know, the forbidden knowledge, you know, uh, above all, was, you know, there, nothing was forbidden in, you know, in Dutch medicine especially. And in, in Japan, some of the Dutch approaches to medicine and anatomy and how you might dissect a corpse to learn more about the body, no, this was not done. So... This doctor uh, has studied these Dutch uh, medical texts. He, uh, he has educated himself in Western ways, and he knows how to perform an autopsy. Or at least he knows how to direct his servants to do so, because even he will not touch the dead. There are very low-class, below-peasant, spit-on-them-as-you-walk-by servants that will do this for you. Um, so... He basically offers to do this autopsy for Sano, and Sano is absolutely repulsed. He's, he's sickened by the idea, but he wants to get at the truth. So he goes ahead and orders the autopsy, and the doctor just begins right there. He doesn't, yeah, Sano's right here, whatever, we're going to do the autopsy. Um, Sano is, he's fascinated, he's sickened, he's repulsed, but he's compelled. And he wants to see what the doctor learns. And the doctor explains to Sano that if these two people drowned, you know, then there would be water in their lungs, which, you know, as Sano thinks about it, makes plenty of sense. Um, but it turns out there isn't. Uh, and further examination reveals that the traumatic wounds, you know, on the head uh, were thought to be due to, you know, hitting the bottom of the river, the river rocks, dragging, um, but actually probably are more like a weapon. Uh, so either way, Sano's suspicions are confirmed. This isn't a Shinju. This is a Satsujin which is a homicide. So his investigations are uh, start with the noble family. And he, uh, you know, winds up twisting through social and political lines that, you know, basically turn this from a mystery into something of political intrigue. So the noble family is, of course, you know, this girl is dead to them. Um, at least, it, you know, it is to the matriarch of the family. There's more to that, and I don't want to get into spoilers here in case you want to read the book yourself. But the, uh, the girl's immediate family and the matriarch of the family are not interested in, you know, solving anything. She's dead and good riddance to her because she was impudent and an upstart and she was in love with an actor, and we are far better than that. Um, so Sano winds up tracing, you know, this trail of homicide from, you know, the highest echelons of government office down to the pleasure quarters of Edo. And that's where, like I said, it becomes this political thriller because someone didn't just want these two lovers dead. Someone is out to assassinate the Shogun. Um, so Sano is incredibly torn. And once again, this goes back to this Japanese worldview. Um, he's a stranger in the big city of Edo. But as a samurai, he's obligated to Bushido, which is the warrior code as well as the tenets of Shinto. Um, defying the orders of the magistrate, which he is certainly doing, is, you know, it's defying an official designee of the shogun himself. And it's basically like defying the shogun directly. Uh, so if he goes too far, 
He dishonors himself and his family name. And that could mean banishment, if he's lucky. It could mean being ordered to commit seppuku or the ritual suicide by self-disembowelment. Yes, this is a painful and horrible way to die, which is why the Japanese saw it as a way to restore one's honor. Um, in other words, you know, he could die if he doesn't succeed, and he could die if he does succeed, but in the wrong way. It's the classic case of damned if you do and damned if you don't. So, this is Lord Joe Rowland's debut novel, and while that kind of shows, I mean, you can tell there are some rough edges here and there, that doesn't make it bad at all. I, I really liked it quite a bit. Um, it's got some inelegant bits, which, you know, it's got some flaws, but they're not glaring. They're not showstoppers. They're not the throw the book across the room kind of thing. Um, the history is spot on, which that's what really drew me in. I, it, it was funny that, you know, I felt, I felt more drawn into the history of the period of the, uh, you know, 17th century Japan, and sort of this was the thing that was just kind of going on. Um, she is she is very good at writing about that. So, um, though some license is taken with the uh, uh, with some of the major historical characters, nothing is really like you know unthinkable. It's not like you know Godzilla suddenly appears out of nowhere and now we have a Japanese kaiju movie. Um, so the history spot on, though some license is taken with the major historical characters like the Shogun, um, but oddly enough that doesn't include his gay lover. Uh, but homosexuality amongst the samurai and the nobility in the shogunate, that's a whole other thing that I'm not going to get into right now. If you're interested, there's a book called Male Colors, The Construction of Homosexuality in Tokugawa, Japan by Dr. Gary Loop of uh, Tufts University. I think it's Tufts University. Um, put that on your reading list. It's accessible, it's not overly academic, and it's available on Kindle. Um, great book on that. Um, but this does become sort of a centerpiece of the intrigue. Um, and it was a joke amongst the, uh, amongst the Yoriki because they sort of joke about his gay lover. Um, the thing is, uh, so this is her debut novel, um, but it's also the first novel in the Sano Ichiro series. This becomes a, you know, a, like many detective books, this becomes a detective series. And I have no idea that, you know, things probably improve. And I'm probably going to check out more in the series as I get a chance. So if you're into Japan, if you're into samurai anything, if you're into sort of the Akira Kurosawa movies, this is pretty good. I mean, it's not sort of the action-packed flavor of, uh, you know, a Kurosawa samurai movie or Yojimbo or um, Zatoichi, the blind swordsman or anything like that. It, but it is very, uh, it is a very good mystery and that turns into a political thriller um, well, you know, I kind of liked it. It's worth checking out. So thanks for bearing with me, y'all, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the, uh, the book talk.